Okay, we're going to look at our last four methods of research methodology. So we're starting with content analysis on page 58. The method of content analysis is almost exclusively confined to the study of the mass media, where it has become one of the most successful methods in use. This can include analysis which takes specific types of media, such as television or newspaper, and examine how particular groups, such as women or ethnic minorities, are represented. This could be as simple as counting how many times a group or type is referred to. It can also investigate specific themes, such as a strike or war, looking to see what messages are encoded within these representations. The language used in the mass media has been of particular interest in content analysis or textual analysis, particularly by the Glasgow University Media Group from their first publication, Bad News, to the present. Okay, so if we are going to analyse something that we are watching on TV, we can consider how many times uh, ethnic groups are represented or women are represented and how they are represented. Is it positive or is it negative, the light that they are shown in? Um, it may be that you look at, a, let's say, take for example a soap opera and you look and you see how many of the characters there represent the diversity of culture within a society. Uh, now, for example, Coronation Street was criticised for the fact that it hadn't had um, an Asian family in a, that was shown in a positive light, reflected in the programme. And so they had to change and bring in different characters. Uh, if you watch soap operas as well, UK ones, you will see that they also have to include uh, and will include um, uh, same-sex relationships because, again, they're criticised if they don't include those types of people in there. And you will see a combination of male and female roles, so your strong male, uh, your, uh, your strong female, your matriarchal type, uh, and and also your sort of characters who are much more manipulated and used in different ways. So we can do this by using content analysis and asking the questions of uh, what it is that uh, what's the message that is trying to be put across about these characters. So such approaches have been frequently criticised for the subjective and selective way in which parts of the mass media have been used to show a perceived bias or partial representation. Any analysis of media presentations will reveal some form of bias which can nevertheless be interpreted differently by different researchers. It is unlikely that a uniform view of such messages will emerge. In this way, it has been argued, for example by Martin Harrison in 1985, that the final research can reveal as much about the values of the research group as the mass media they are investigating. Equally, little or no attempt is made to discover how these messages are received or decoded by their intended audience. So researcher bias comes into it if a female is analysing how women are presented uh, within a certain show, then they may have a completely different viewpoint if a man was watching that and analysing it. And what we don't know ultimately is what the audience actually think. So we may watch something and think this is a dominant female character who will be well liked by the public, but the public may absolutely hate this character and think she's just bossy and uh, manipulative. So we don't know the response that comes from it. With audience analysis, a form of content analysis, some attempt is made to overcome these problems. In David Morley's now classic study of the 1970s television news magazine Nationwide, Different social groups, students, businessmen, trade unionists, were shown the same episode of a television news magazine and questioned about their perception of the programme. However, this is still a long way from gauging audience interpretation of the mass media in their own, more natural setting, such as the home, where they may respond differently. So what David Morley tried to do was actually take this to a different level and say, OK, well, let's ask different groups of people how they respond to a particular program. So he showed them this uh, one episode of Nationwide uh, and he asked them to analyse it and he then looked at the different responses. Did he get different answers from businessmen? Did uh, he get different answers from uh, students, from males, from females? But again this was criticised because this wasn't people sitting at home watching the TV and making a response. They were watching it within uh, a certain um, room where they may be therefore felt slightly out of sync with what they were watching and therefore their responses were coloured by uh, the area that they were in. 
All right, semiology. Semiology is usually associated with the structuralist approach to sociology and the contributions of Ferdinand de Saussure and, the late, and later Claude Levi-Strauss. It is concerned with examining the science of signs, particularly those contained within language. According to Saussure, any sign consists of two parts, the signified and the signifier, where the signified is the concept which is being indicated, sometimes referred to as a text and the signifier is the way the object is thought of when it is mentally recited, the meaning we give to that object. Signifiers are defi defined in terms of other signifiers, mm. and beneath these signifiers lie linguistic rules concerning their usage in relation to each other. These rules constitute the structure of a language which Saussure refers to as its langue, which is the French for language. Um, okay, so when we're looking at this, there are certain signs that we will see within language. Now, we hear words, and to us, um, in our mind, we perceive something specific when we hear that word. Okay, And uh, so, uh, when we're looking at semiology, the idea is that um, we will hear a word, and it indicates a certain thing to us. Now, this is going to be different depending on uh, the person, the culture, uh, the maybe the class, the gender, the age, the ethnicity, all of those things are, are going to make a difference. And this is where there is a problem with semiology again. So language in use is referred to as parole. These are the words that are passed between people in their interaction or discourse, whether verbally or in writing. In using these words as signifiers, Saussure argues that they refer not to the world of objects and things, but to other related signifiers. Signs therefore become more real than the objects behind them, and together we can be seen as part of a socialised code. Our ability to understand the world is limited to the words we have available to describe it, and the scope and variety of the words used to describe the signified will vary from culture to culture, each carrying differences of meaning within them. Okay, now say for example you receive um, a letter from somebody that you work with and it starts off by saying uh, that I want to thank you for everything that you have done. Automatically we have a far more positive uh, outlook on what this uh, letter is talking about. Now, in that letter it may go on to actually criticise something that you do at work and ask you to change the way that you do things, but because you've been thanked initially um, people will have a far more positive approach and think this person is trying to help me to move forward. Okay? If, however, you receive a letter which starts off being very critical, uh, then a person will regard that negatively. And it's the same in conversations that you have or uh, the way that you do things. Now, people will say to you, do you mind if I'm honest? Okay? And, and we, we will say, yeah, of course, be honest about it. I want to know what you really think. But actually, deep down, maybe sometimes we don't want to know what somebody really thinks because it, we may find it hurtful or uh, it may be something that's difficult to hear. Uh, and it may go very much against what it is that we, uh, we feel or we understand. Uh, so therefore, language becomes a really... Um, and like a, a minefield that we are going through because people pick and choose the words that they use um, because there is a message that they want to give across or they you know sometimes they will use easier language because they think that's going to be more appropriate to the audience they are working with um, and so you know we have to be really careful when we're looking at semiology because there are all sorts of signs that could be given to us other than just the meaning uh, of what the person is actually saying. So language and the rules underlying its use therefore becomes the object of sociological interest in that they will reveal much about the culture of a society and the shared meanings that exist within it, as phenomenologists have urged. It informs work on areas such as conversational analysis and the concept of labelling in deviance and education. So yes, in conversation, how honest are we, what words do we use, and this tells us a lot about the culture as well when you're uh, doing an analysis of them. More recently, semiological analysis has extended beyond language to other areas such as clothing, in for example the study of youth subcultures, um, such as uh, Dick Hebbage also discussed in chapter one, or the role of television, film, or advertising in the mass media, for example, Robert Hodge and David Tripp. 
The semiological method can be extended beyond language and linguistics to all of human experience, which can be read as a text in the same way. Reading these texts, therefore, involves a process of decoding or deconstruction. Okay, so it's not just words now that we're talking about. It can also be the things that you do, the things that you wear, um, the products you buy, all of those types of things. Semiological analysis is a relatively new approach in sociology and has contributed much to the analysis of the mass media in particular. It is not without its critics, however, particularly the view that an encoded sign can be universally decoded to reveal the same meaning to all actors. Wearing jeans may still signify a fashionable and rebellious stance to some people who are over the age of 50, while to younger people they may be just indicate comfortable middle age. Not all encoded messages are read in the way their encoders may have intended. Messages are polysemic, having many meanings. Okay, and I think that's important. When you're watching um, a TV show, when you're watching a film, when you're reading a newspaper, people will interpret things in different ways because obviously they interpret it from their own understanding, their own experiences in life. Uh, and this is why somebody will come away from the cinema having watched a film and think it's the best thing they've ever seen, and somebody else will come away thinking, hmm, it was just okay. All right, so you have to have these differences and there's not always going to be the same understanding by people. When I went to see Platoon, uh, I watched it in America and to me the whole point of the film Platoon was that war is futile and that young lives are lost and that is a terrible thing to be happening. Um, now there were two situations in the film uh, which were very gung-ho and uh, the audience actually cheered and I'm sitting there thinking they don't they don't get it they don't get what the whole meaning of this film is you know and so there's this you know for them it was about patriotism and doing things for your country and fighting for what was right and for me it was like no what Oliver Stone is trying to say is that this is futile and a ridiculous waste and um, so the message is going to be different for different people. And documents. The range and type of documents that sociologists may access are enormous and can include historical documents such as church records uh, and early censuses which allow a longitudinal and qual quantitative view to be taken as well as life documents such as diaries, letters and even suicide notes. Durkheim in particular, where detailed qualitative information about the subjective side of people's lives can be gathered. As historical and life documents represent secondary data for sociologists not generated for specific research pur purposes, they are particularly open to selective interpretation. The usefulness of life documents can depend on the audience they were written for. Where sociologists have asked for research subjects to keep diaries, for example, they are more likely to contain relevant material than privately kept diaries, which are only made public several years later. The latter may reveal more about the subject's own introspective state than events in the world around them. Okay, so whilst there are certain documents which are useful, um, which uh, have statistics and so on, they are collected for a particular reason and it may not fit precisely with the sociological research that is being done. Uh, when we're talking about personal um, documents, for example diaries, somebody may be in a really bad mood when they write a diary entry or a really good mood and that will change the perception that they have and the way that they write things. So we can't know that what they're writing is accurate because it, it's guided by emotional uh, and uh, emotions and feelings. Um, in the same way, something like a suicide note is, uh, you know, somebody is not in a very happy state of mind when they write a suicide note. So we can't know that what they write is actually um, the truth, um, although it may be the truth as they perceive it. So again, these, these things are, are very difficult to use. If you ask someone to keep a diary, then they're going to consider it more carefully because they know it's going to be read by somebody afterwards. Um, so, for example, in the past, I kept a food diary. I used to do it for two weeks, uh, about once or twice a year, I think, and it used to go towards like an official statistics investigation. Um, you know, but during that time that I kept the food diary, I ate differently because I used to think I won't have that chocolate because I've got to write that in my diary because I was being honest in what I was filling in. So actually it made me eat better. 
Um, so again, it's not necessarily a true response, and this is always going to be the problem with researching with humans, that they will respond in different ways and react differently because of the um, false environment they're being put into. So, official statistics. Official statistics are data gathered by government bodies for a wide variety of purposes, such as recording demographic details in censuses, unemployment and crime rates, records of birth, marriages and deaths, and educational performance through the collection of statistics, such as examination results. As they have not been gathered for explicitly sociological purposes, they represent secondary data for sociologists. They represent an important source of quantitative data that is readily available and cheap to attain covering very large samples, sometimes detailing trends over many decades or even centuries. They appear to be objective and representative, gathered for neutral purposes. Um, okay, again, yes, so we can use these, and it is very helpful to have them as background information that we can then show the changes that are happening if we look at what is happening right now. Okay, so it gives that longitudinal um, essence to what you are studying. Um, Yes, for me particularly, if you think of things like educational performance through examination results, what they don't show you is the value added to those students. So whilst in a grammar school in the UK, which is a selective school, you may get close to 100% aid stars to C, those students probably would have got those grades when they entered the school in any case because they were already bright students. What we don't see are um, how much did they move people forward. Um, so whilst you may have a school that's maybe only getting 65% A stars to C, I say only, I still think that's good, um, whilst that's maybe what they're getting, um, what, we, what we really need to know is what would those students have got uh, without the teaching that went on in that school. So again, we have to be a little bit careful with official statistics. They are also a source of data that sociologists have learned to be wary of. This is not only because their use can at best be indirect, but because a number of important questions have been raised concerning their validity, particularly by interactionist sociologists, who see them not as hard social facts, but as having been socially constructed, the end result of a series of common sense assumptions. Okay, and when the government collects certain official statistics, they again may be doing it for a specific reason. The problems surrounding the use of official statistics in sociology can be seen most clearly in the field of crime and deviance. For many years around the turn of the 20th century, crime statistics, including those for suicide, were taken at face value by sociologists and uncritically incorporated into their research. In the second half of the century, sociologists began to view them more uh, sceptically raising fundamental questions about the validity of such data and whether the richness and variety of human experience could ever be represented by numeric tables and data sets. Okay, so statistics are useful, but suddenly they wanted to see what was going on behind those statistics. At the heart of the problem lies the concern that all information, official or not, has at some point been created from human experience. What is presented as a fact is really the choice of some people to see some activities as significant enough to try to represent that activity quantitative, quantitatively. These facts are really the end product of a series of choices. Crime statistics, which rely on a chain of individuals, the public, police and other officials, deciding on the nature of such behaviour, will therefore always be vulnerable to changes in public priorities concerning what is significant and what is not. This is illustrated very clearly by Cicero's work on the problems of accurately recording rates of juvenile delinquency in California. Okay, now, the police may consider something not important enough to follow up on. Okay, so the person may get a slap on the wrist, they may get a warning, but the, nothing goes down on a criminal record. Uh, now, if you ask somebody else what they've experienced, they may say something, you know, they may talk about that. But if the police don't deem it to be worthy of being prosecuted, uh, then the official crime statistics aren't accurate. So we have to think about that beforehand. Attempts have been made by official statisticians to address some of these criticisms, for example through self-report crime studies such as the various British crime surveys, which attempt to capture, uh, capture crimes unreported to the police. In this way, it is argued, the validity of crime statistics can be increased and the true extent of crime discovered. 
However, critics argue because of the way these surveys are conducted, all of the problems associated with methods such as questionnaires and structured interviews remain, particularly the expectation that respondents can and will give an honest and accurate account of what they know. You know, people may boast in these things, people may exaggerate things that have happened to them, okay? or people may still want to keep quiet about stuff, so we still can't be certain that these are completely accurate. For conflict sociologists, official statistics are immediately problematic in that they have been produced for the state, which they regard as an instrument of the ruling class or elite. Official statistics are therefore far from neutral and exist to sustain the power of the dominant, as Ian Miles and John Irvin argue. Okay, so if this is produced by the state, they may have certain things that they want to show. So they may show that certain things have reduced, things like unemployment, things like crime, um, and they may show that other things have increased. So um, uh, the general wealth of the population, let's say, for example. Uh, the statistics are not lies or fabrications, but will be collected for ideological purposes to create or support a particular view of the world that favours the interest of the ruling group. Data that may be embarrassing, such as high unemployment rates or long hospital waiting lists, will be distorted in such a way as not to reflect the underlying realities. Okay, So notice they're not saying they're lying, they're just saying they're distorting things. And we can always use statistics um, to help support whatever we want. We need to know the background to them, because you can take a statistic out of, out of place and just use it the way that you want to use it. In some instances, the data may cease being collected, as with the decision in the early 1980s in the UK to abolish the Royal Commission on the Distribution of Income and Wealth, okay, because it wasn't reflecting positively on what the government wanted to say. The frameworks within which statistics are created also reveal much about the values of those who create them. The Registrar General's Standard Occupational Classification is a good example for conflict sociologists here where for this group the classification presents a view of stratification that ignores the class conflict in society between those who rule and those who are ruled. Okay, so this Registrar General's Standard Occupational Classification looked at jobs and then put them into a class structure. So a teacher is a middle class job, right? Um, now, what our Marxists are saying and our conflict sociologists are saying is that what this does is it gives people a perception of class ideology, and this is wrong. So this view of official statistics, however, is less persuasive in view of the fact that a great number of statistics resulting from the use of this classification show strong correlation between social class and poor health, education and welfare as they have since it was first introduced in 1911 to examine whether infant mortality was related to social class. So actually this registrar, uh, general registrar's, um, sorry, registrar's general uh, standard occupational classification has been used and has actually been used in a positive way because what it's done is say, right, we need to think about the education that people get so that we can help them um, to overcome uh, problems within their families such as children dying at a young age because we can stop them from having those illnesses that will affect them. So we do have to be careful of this. Obviously, conflict sociologists are always going to be against state apparatus as they perceive them. Um, but actually, uh, some of these official statistics can be really helpful in moving a society forwards.